Today's reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. Now after he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them, as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Later he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were sitting at the table, and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness, because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The word of God for the people of God. Christ is risen! Oh, good job! Happy Easter! I realize that it's kind of the, the half birthday of Easter, given that it's September and all, and you weren't really expecting an Easter story. But it is part of the tradition of the teachings of the church that every Sunday is actually a mini Easter. And we are called to celebrate the good news that Jesus is risen from the dead every week regardless of what else we happen to be talking about today. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Margaret Gillikin, and I serve as the district superintendent of the Trinity District, which is in southeastern Colorado. And I go from, I can see Oklahoma or Kansas or New Mexico from here, all the way to the Continental Divide, which is basically a geography the same size as the state of Pennsylvania, which sounds really impressive until you remember that we have district superintendents who have territories, oh, all of Wyoming. Right, so no big deal, just lots of dust, lots of miles. It is a delight to be with you and to share with my friend Stephanie in bringing good news to you in this place on this weekend when uh, we're in that in-between time, right, of we've had vacation, we started school, we have a little bit more vacation before we really do school, and all the things that come with the school year. And so, like what a lot of our children are going to be doing in their classrooms, they're going to kind of be remembering, rehearsing some of the things they've learned previously just to kind of get the, the wheels in motion in, in our brains, okay? So are you ready to kind of remember with me some of our stories of faith? So we are starting with Easter, okay? Um, in the gospel story that's been told here, we, we get uh, this commandment to, to go, to proclaim the good news, and biblical scholars teach us that this is actually the second ending to the Gospel of Mark. The first ending was that Mary Magdalene and the other women went to the tomb, and they saw the risen Christ, and they were so scared, they ran away and said nothing to anyone. You can see why some editor a long time ago might have thought that having fear be the end of the resurrection story might not have been a good thing. Okay, this is supposed to be good news, right? Running away, not talking, that's not good news. So how do we make this good news? So we did a little adjusting. But I have to admit, it sounds pretty human, doesn't it? To run away, scared to talk, even when we've been invited to speak early and often because, well, it's scary. It's scary to say bold, amazing things to people who aren't necessarily interested in hearing them. If nothing else, we risk becoming the subject of gossip when we do stuff like that. Can you imagine what happened when those women went and started telling what they had been told to share? Can you imagine what happened in the marketplaces in Jerusalem? 
Have you heard? Have you heard those, those followers of that rabbi, that rabbi Jesus who got himself killed? Those, those women, they say he's alive. Esta chica loca! So it's pretty human to keep our mouths zipped. But instead, we're called to open our mouths, to open our lives, to share the goodness that we have received. And so in this version of the Gospel of Mark, we are really told in no uncertain terms, get out there and talk. Now, if proclaiming good news sounds suspiciously like the dreaded E-word, evangelism, to you, then I congratulate you on being a well-formed, mainline Protestant Christian. (laughs) Because most of us are highly allergic to the evangelism word. We've looked around and seen what our brothers and sisters in more conservative Uh, branches of the tree of faith have been up to for the last couple of generations and most of us kind of go does not look like a good time and so we avoid it like the plague and so this push for us to use our words well we're pretty reluctant to go in that direction And in this day and age when we are increasingly challenged to do such basic things as having civil conversations with people who are of different opinions than ourselves, it's really risky to have a conversation of any depth with anyone that we don't know phenomenally well. And so this is a big deal. It really is. But the thing is, is that God is in the business of making covenants with humanity. I don't know if any of you were able to attend Mission U this summer, but one of the studies that they did was looking at the covenants that God makes with humanity in Scripture. And the first of those covenants comes in the book of Genesis, And it is the covenant of responsibility. It's framed in terms of care of creation. But God says to humanity, I am making you responsible for the earth and everything in it. And typically when we hear the word responsible, we think about, oh, I hate when I'm responsible for taking out the trash, for feeding the dog, Responsibility sounds like duty, it sounds like obligation, it sounds like, well, hard work. Sounds like I might have to go home and weed the garden. But if we just put one little extra character in the word responsible, we get a new concept, which is response-able. And so what this first covenant with humanity is really all about is how God has created us as creatures who are able to respond. We are able to respond to God. We are able to respond to each other. We are able to hear to listen, to understand, and to act according to our circumstances and what is going on in the world around us. And so what this means is that any tendency, so very human, that we have to act, well, like turtles, and to kind of pull our heads back into the safety of our shell when there's stuff going on that we don't particularly like and would rather not have to deal with. When there's stuff that's happening in the news that, well, we'd like to be protected from. When there's stuff that's happening in our families that, 
uh, just makes our hearts hurt and we get tired, we get compassion fatigue. Whenever we try to hide from the very things God calls us to respond to, well, we find ourselves in the difficult position of breaking that covenant with God. And so one of the things that I really want you to hear today is that as Christians, part of God's call to each and every one of us is that we are called to stick our necks out. We're called to be brave. We're called to be courageous. Um, I'm guessing that many of you are familiar with the communications slogan of the United Methodist Church. We are folks who have open hearts, open minds, open doors, right? It's a really great advertising campaign. It is also phenomenally rich theology that I invite you to take seriously. Because when we keep our hearts open, that is what allows God to speak to us. That is what allows us to hear each other's prayer concerns and to allow our hearts to be broken. Three children committed suicide this week. Oh my Lord, that is devastating. We're called to have our minds open. So that when circumstances like Hurricane Harvey arise, we can use our brilliance and our imagination to come up with solutions that matter. And we're called to keep our doors open, not just so that others can come and join you here, but so that we can go out. And we can do what was on the slide a little while ago where it had the intersection of love God and love people. And we could go out into the world to love God and love people everywhere we go. So that openness that we are called to is really a way of life. And if you've ever wondered in your prayers why God doesn't do something about, well, you fill in the blank. The good news, bad news of the gospel, of being people who are in covenant with God, is that, well, my friends, the church, the church is God's strategy for dealing with the challenges of our world. We, all of us, are God's answer to disaster relief, whether it's fires in Montana or hurricanes in Texas. We are God's answer to hate just boiling up in our culture so that it manifests in KKK rallies. We are God's answer to poverty. We are God's answer to the 43 armed conflicts currently blazing across the planet. We are how God chooses to address the very great needs of our world. And so it matters. It matters that we participate in those means of service that the church has traditionally named mission. It matters that you would be one of 25% of Americans who's willing to have a conversation about climate change, much less adjust your behavior or encourage anyone else you know to do likewise. It makes a difference that you might be someone willing to do something on behalf of the 60 million refugees currently on the planet as a result of those 43 wars. You might not be able to do it all by yourself. You might need the help of your friends. But can you imagine what would happen if this congregation got together and you pooled your resources and sponsored a family, a refugee family, and helped live into your name? to give hope to a family that needs it desperately. 
And what if you did that this year and next year and the year after that? There's so much that a group of faithful people can do together. And if you chose instead to channel your energy, your resources into advocacy, well, you could affect change for hundreds and thousands of families. There is so much that you could do on behalf of the 15% of children in the state of Colorado who live in poverty. Well, and actually, that statistic breaks down into a pretty startling way. You see, it's 10% of white children and 20% of African American, Latino, and Native American children who live in poverty in Colorado. I don't know about you, but as a longtime Coloradan, I've kind of patted myself on the back more than once thinking, oh, we don't have a racism problem in this state. Really? You got brown skin, your chances are doubled of being in poverty. That might just be a race problem, folks. And just because we don't have Confederate statues in our town squares to wrangle over doesn't mean we don't have parts of our history that we need to take a hard look at. In my district, there are multiple massacre sites where white settlers slaughtered Native Americans. The most famous of those massacre sites is the Sand Creek site close to Eads, which you may have heard about through uh, so much of the work that Bishop Elaine Stanofsky did while she was with us. And I can tell you that that work is ongoing. And so if you were of a mind to open your mind and learn some more about that aspect of our faith heritage, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, you could go downtown Denver and participate in the remembrance service. And I assure you that you would learn. You would learn a lot. What you learned might break your heart if you opened it to that learning. But I can also tell you that your presence, showing up, being there, would be huge. Because as we've done this work with the descendants of the tribes who suffered violence at Sand Creek, they have come to really see us as their brothers and sisters. And it matters to them when the descendants of the Methodists who prepared who perpetrated that violence show up so that we can be descendants together and we can learn new ways to be in community to be family together tribal descendants and faith descendants together and I realize that may sound scary that may sound vulnerable and yet, it is a profound gift that I would encourage you to seek out. So we all know, we all know there's so much to be done. And we also are pretty sure that we can't do it all. And most of us have our moments when we wrestle over well how how do you do these things because we all know back to that awful e word we all know there's some really bad ways of doing this you know if you if you've ever seen a cheerleader at a pep squad rally anybody seen a cheerleader in action okay the rah rah stuff christ is risen good news might not be the best strategy to use in most situations, especially not with people who are busy, who are stressed, who are burdened, who are struggling, who are tired, who are hot and angry and currently obsessed with road rage because they've been sitting on I-25 for an hour. It's really not a very good strategy. So what does work? What can we do? How can we share good news in a way that might actually be received? 
So I believe that one of the most significant things that we can do if we really want the good news we share to be received is to let go of being in the position of the one who has. I have money, I have time, I have ingenuity, I have faith, and I'm going to give those things to you. Lucky you. Ugh. When our offerings come with the stickiness of charity, when it feels like what we're really giving is pity, that isn't received eagerly by anyone. And, and, and before we go on, I want to I do a little privilege busting. And I do this very much as a neighbor. Because, you see, I lived in this zip code for almost a decade of my life, in my 20s. I didn't attend Cherry Creek High School, but my younger sisters did. And, and so I'm pretty familiar with the waters you all swim in. And, and I remember what it was like to not be the richest, most privileged person in any room. And I imagine that every single one of you can look around, not too far from you, and find somebody who's better off than you. And you also know the interior workings of your work circumstances, your family, your neighborhood, and you know, you know the pain, you know the grief, you know the difficulties, you know the pressures, the stresses of the life you lead, and it really doesn't always feel all that great. And so to hear that, well, you're pretty privileged. Well, we can put up a wall to hearing that really easily because we look around and we see, you know what? Other people have it a lot easier than I do. I don't feel all that privileged. But statistically, folks, the median income of this zip code is twice that of the rest of the state. And, and having gone through a school system much like Cherry Creek Schools in another state and seen my sisters go through this one, I can tell you that it really makes a difference when not just your parents, but the parents of every other kid you know are all equally desirous of their children being effective adults, being well-educated, that when the water you swim in is water that says it matters that you achieve, it matters that you fulfill your potential, that affects us. And when, lo and behold, 20 years after you graduate from school, you turn out to be a success, yeah! But guess what? You didn't do it all by your lonesome. You were supported by the culture that you are a product of. Not only the attitudes and values and beliefs of your own family, but all of the families that lived in your neighborhood and the teachers who helped you and that structure of the education that you're a product of. And education and culture are just a couple of the building blocks of privilege. Money is only one piece of it. There's a lot of factors that go into what makes us privileged. And I say us completely wholeheartedly. I am not separating myself from you at all. I am absolutely part of that privilege. And I'm not telling you that that's something to be ashamed of or something to regret or something to reject. But I would invite each of us to consider how it is something that we can share how it is that we can open ourselves to using all of the ways we've been blessed on behalf of others and not from that icky, I'm going to give to those who don't have. Ugh. 
All right, now we're back to that conundrum, right, of how do we do this in a way that people can actually receive? How do we go from pity to compassion? And, and to be honest, I, I don't completely have that answer for you. But the answer that I am discovering for myself is that it's a, there's a, it's a two-part thing. The first part is that adopting a spirituality of contemplation helps a lot. And then when you pair that with an action strategy of partnership, it's a one-two knockout punch. So let's talk about contemplation. What that really is, is all about listening. It's letting go of the practice of telling. Um, I don't know about any of you, but I would say that uh, many of my prayers really boil down to telling God. I tell God uh, what I want, and then I kind of sit around waiting for God to fulfill on the answer. Anybody here like to tell God? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like it a lot. But contemplation doesn't tell God. Contemplation listens. And it's not just sitting still and playing the quiet game, which I can tell you I am terrible at. I was that kid in the carpool when I was growing up when some poor mother, including my own, said, let's play the quiet game. And I was the kid in the back seat who would say, I lose. <laughs> the quiet game? <laughs> but listening to God, Engaging in contemplation, which is really listening with the ear of the heart. Listening to God deeply and for long stretches of time is a way in which we can begin to be reshaped, reformed, not by the world around us, the water we normally swim in, not the place where we hear that voice in our head that tells us all those things that your voice tells you. Mine says, I'm not good enough. Maybe yours says, I'm not strong enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not something enough. But whatever your voice says, in contemplation, God has an opportunity to gently shift that voice out of the primary position and reassert God's voice saying, who you are is my precious, beloved child. I love you and I am with you always. That is who you are. Contemplation allows us to breathe deeply and to actually become beloved. And when we come from that space of being loved deeply by God, guess what? All of those things that we think are so important, our ego, our pride, our control, they just fall away. We no longer have to actively let go of them. They've just fallen away. And it turns out to be easy to let go of our pride, to let go of control. It turns out to be easy that when we are filled with the fullness of God, everything else just disappears. And when we are filled with God, what we have is our love for God and our love for who God loves, which turns out to be everybody, right? And then it's really easy to come alongside people in a different way. And instead of wanting to be the ones to give to them, we find within ourselves the capacity to be with them instead. So here's where we're going to uh, try on another story from the Bible. So, so let's gear up our remembers a little bit. Um, who remembers the story of the feeding of the 5,000? 
Okay? We got that story? You remember that one? So, um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about this story, and it's all in service to this idea of what it means to be missional. Because mission is how the church talks about how do we be of service to the world, right? But missional sounds kind of funky, but really all it does is it adds the word relational to mission. And relational, being relational, is about having a relationship, having a trusting relationship. And you know what the best way to build trust is with somebody? It's to listen to them. So you start listening to God, and all of a sudden you find it a lot easier to listen to the people around you. That's cool. So we're starting this strategy of listening here and being missional. And what Elaine Heath teaches about being missional is that the first step of being missional is to show up. All right, so let's go back to the story of the 5,000. So Jesus was with the disciples, and he had been teaching, and he was tired. He got in a boat. He was going to go to another, the next stage of their journey, and he thought he was going to a quiet place to pray, and instead, all these people showed up, right? And we know that it wasn't really 5,000. Anybody have a guess how many it actually was? Fifteen thousand, twenty thousand, twenty-five thousand, thirty thousand. It's anybody's guess, right? Because they only counted the grown-up men. I think I would have counted. I think you would have counted too. But they didn't count everybody. So we know we know that it was a lot more than 5,000 people showed up that day. And what showing up means is that when 25,000 people show up at Cherry Creek Reservoir, you don't shut the door of your house and all your windows and complain about the noise problem. You actually walk out the door and go find out what's going on here. What are all these people doing here? There's traffic for miles. You leave the sanctuary and you go to where the people are. That's what it means to show up. The next step of being missional is to pay attention. This might mean that you actually have to like put on your Sherlock Holmes hat and ask some questions. Um, excuse me, sir, what's going on? Why are you here? And, and, and look! Look around you. Who are these people? What kind of people showed up? Are they young people? Are they old people? Are they in-between people? Are they white people? Are they brown people? Are they speaking English? Who's here? And what are they hoping for? What are they expecting to get here? Have you ever thought about what people would have said if you had gotten a chance to be an investigative reporter at the feeding of the 5,000 and you would ask the crowd, so you came... You came here to this hillside today. What do you think is going to happen? Who knows what they were expecting? But when we pay attention, when we ask those questions, we get an opportunity to hear people's hopes and dreams, to hear a little bit about who they are. And, and it's not a time for us to correct them or to teach them. It's just... Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate knowing what matters to you. And then the next step is to cooperate with God. And this is one of those places where, well, the rubber kind of meets the road of faith. Because I have often thought that the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 was not what Jesus did with bread and fish that day. It's that the disciples actually listened to what he had to say and obeyed him. Because I don't know about y'all, but I'm, kind of, I'm almost as allergic to the obey word as I am to the evangelism word. Ugh. But they did. Yeah, they did. They obeyed when Jesus told them how to organize the crowd and how to get everything set up to make it work. They did what he told them. 
and part of what is involved in obedience is that when we obey what somebody else says to do, when we take direction, uh, that means that we also had to give up control. Anyone else here a charter member of Control Freaks Anonymous? Yeah. Hi, my name is Margaret. Yeah. Letting go of that one, that uh, can be a lifetime work. And so to cooperate with God means to set aside our own need, our own desire to be in charge, to tell other people what to do, and instead to be told what to do and to go along with that. But cooperating with God is even a bigger deal. This is where we get to the partnership part of the equation. Remember, we had contemplation and partnership. Because when we cooperate with God, that means when Jesus tells us to ask the crowd, what do they have that might be helpful to us? Then that means that we receive as well as give. When we step out of that position of giving to, and we go empty-handed, and I'm pretty clear that Jesus went empty-handed into that situation on purpose. Because there are other places in the gospel where Jesus sends other people out empty-handed on purpose. And truthfully, in this day and age, if you had a traveling speaker who got the kinds of crowds to show up the way Jesus did, if 25,000 people were going to show up at the football field at Cherry Creek High School, don't you think the Greenwood Village Police would have expected them to get some permits or something? <laughs> and at the very least called in some food trucks? So to go in unprepared was not really good planning. But Jesus was not a bad leader. He was a very good leader, so he must have done that on purpose. Why? Why would he go empty-handed on purpose? So that, so that they would have an opportunity to ask, do you have anything we can use today? No? How about you? trying to feed a bunch of people. Do you have anything you could share? Because it's when we actually start looking around at the people who are right by our sides, that's when the miracle happens of, oh boy, tomatoes! <laughs> nice. But this is when little boys share their lunch, right? And you get loaves and fishes enough to feed thousands. When we combine humility, the humility of giving up our pride, giving up our control, we combine humility with creativity and partnership and faith. That's when we get miracles. And guess what, folks? We get them every time. Predictably, that's how God shows up. And when we go to, when we be with, when we listen to God and listen to the people around us with the ears of our heart, that is when the good news of Jesus being raised from the dead and all power being accessible to us here and now, that's when that lives. And that is when we are able to proclaim with our hands, our ears, and our lives that good news is with us. And so my prayer, my prayer is that we would find ourselves more and more able to listen, to listen to the stories we know so well, to listen with all of who we are, to who we're called to be, to remember that who we are 
isn't whatever the nasty voice inside your head says, but who you are is God's beloved, and that who we are is people who are inheritors of a rich story, of a rich faith that shapes us in ways equally profound to what it comes from living in a certain zip code. And that who we are is people who come to this table and share in a story that focuses on a covenant of bread Remembering that in times of great need, when no one had any idea how we were going to even eat today, God gave manna. And when God sent Jesus into the world, he took that bread of remembrance and turned it into new life. And similarly took that cup of covenant and said, this is given for forgiveness for everyone, not just the people who were born into this story, but all those who claim it to you, who choose it, who respond to God's invitation of love. This meal is given to nourish you, to nurture you, to call you back to God, to remind you who you are, and also what God wants to do in and through you. And so, my friends, this is the last part of our getting geared up, remembering who we are and what our story is, so that in the days and weeks and months to come, we can really live into it. We can dig into it. We can be. We can be good news. And so, I invite you to pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit, even as you have been with us in this time of worship, we ask that you would especially bless this table, this grain of the field and fruit of the vine, and that you would bless all those in this place, that these gifts of bread and cup might be for us the body and blood of Christ, and that we who are many might be made one in this meal that we might receive from your loving hand all the grace we need to make possible what is impossible, for love to multiply, for grace to come alive. We ask all of these things in Jesus' holy name.